Hello, everyone. Good to see you all. Harold will be joining us in just a second. See, we have some new friends today, which is awesome. And some returning faces, which is just as awesome. All righty, Harold is joining us now and then we can all get started. All righty, hi Harold. Just welcome to everybody and when you're ready, hi, I'll give the spiel and we can get started. I'm ready. Awesome. Well, so, I'm ready. Welcome everyone today. Harold is going to be talking um, about Mozart's Ave Verum Corpus and also the Grand Mass in C. Um, as always, there'll be a live Q&A for all of your questions, open to everybody on this webinar today. If you have any questions during the session, you can also raise your hand and Harold will call on you to answer. Since there are so many of us, we ask that you put yourself on mute just to avoid any extra feedback. Um, to unmute yourself, you can hold down the space bar and when you release it, it'll automatically mute yourself again. You, if this doesn't work on your computer though, you can always use the microphone button that's on the bottom left hand side of your screen. Beyond tonight's Q&A, Harold is offering to be available at any time. Uh, you just simply have to email him your questions at haroldrosenbaum at gmail.com and he can set up a phone call or a Zoom meeting with you. And we'll be sending over more information about the organization on the chat box. Um, please use this for to look up Harold, look about more about our choirs. Um, and it also includes a donation link. Um, these donations are tax deductible and they go to a great cause. So if you are interested, please check that out. Um, please use the chat chat box also or the email that we have been communicating with you um, in order to request any technological assistance during the tonight's session. And lastly, we'll be recording and archiving this video as we do with every video and we will send you the material to revisit at your leisure via email. Um, and that also will give you access to all of the previous videos that we have been um, recording. We hope you enjoy this wonderful series tonight. And Harold, you may take it over. Okay, welcome everybody. I see a few new faces. Um, I see one that's labeled Jeff, but it seems to be not Jeff. Who, can I ask who you are? It's Elise. You can unmute yourself, no? Okay. It's Elise. <laughs> so, oh, Elise. I'm on my what a right. Oh, there you are. There you are. <laughs> Great. Yeah. What's that? I took my husband's computer. Oh, okay. And Judith Weiss, do I know? I can see that. Thank you. And Judith, have we met? I can't tell. Anyway, you can unmute yourself or not. Um, okay. Hi. Long ago. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to start right in uh, with these two amazing pieces. Um, so, uh, Karina will put <clears throat> the Abbe Verum Corpus up first. This, again, this is not, a, I'm not a musicologist, so I'm not going to talk about, you know, historical things. I'll just delve right into the music. By the way, except for the Brahms Requiem, every single piece on this 30-week 30, uh, 30 series I've conducted, the Brahms Requiem I trained choirs for twice, but... Um, so obviously I've done, I've done everything else. Well, not obviously, but I just have. Okay, so uh, this is actually the last completed composition he wrote. And I have very strong feelings about how, how I would do this. Um, so, you know, with, with an orchestra, I've done this with orchestra, I've done this with, you know, organ, piano. So. I think with an orchestra with sustaining strings, you can actually take a, a slower tempo than if you're doing it with a piano. You all know when once you strike a key on the piano, it starts to disappear. But you know, I, I can even see taking this one, 
two, three, four, one. That's quite slow, but it works with the strings sustaining. Now, um, my, a general principle, as I've said before, <clears throat> when I see a repeated word or a portion of the text within a phrase repeated, I generally like to at least ask myself, do I want to separate them? So you have Ave, Ave, you know, hail, true body. Um, so do you want to go, no separation, or like a little lift, a pausa, you know? And if so, you have to mark that in the score. Everything, again, everything I, that, I, you know, before before going to the first rehearsal, everything is marked in the score uh, in each part. Everybody's sitting there with marked up parts. You don't have to waste time telling them how much of a breath to take. Um, in this case, uh, you know, you, you can put a, I, I put a vertical line in my score intersecting the top two lines or so of the staff to indicate a, a break. But if it turns out to be exactly an eighth breath, you can put that in also. Anyway, um, the um, the breath marks, you know, after after corpus, there should be a breath, obviously. And that, that should be a quarter breath, I think. I think that, um, con you know, words that end with consonants sometimes will determine that it should be a, um, a, a longer breath than if a word ends with a vowel and the next one starts with a vowel. So you don't need as much breath because, I mean, you're, you're spitting out consonants. So if you're spitting out consonants, you need a, a little bit of longer breath, it seems to me. Anyway, let's, let's also um, review the concept that uh, pretty much without exception, every phrase should have a peak and the peak corresponds to how you would speak it, ave verum corpus. Some people might say ave verum corpus. I don't see it that way. Hail true body. So ave, ave, even though cor, C-O-R in the soprano part is one of the lowest notes, it should be emphasized. And you can do that with a little crescendo mark, you know, from the previous measure, like the last, from the previous G to that, or you might put a little horizontal line beneath corpus. Um, it's especially important to do that when, you know, a, a, a weak syllable is on a high note where you don't want to, well, let's, let's say a strong syllable is on uh, a, a lower note than the one before it, uh, or even when it's the same. For, so for example, in the tenor part, you know, a typical, let's say high school or college Chorus will sing verum corpus with no understanding that it should be verum corpus. And you don't have to exaggerate the way I just did. Anyway, let's go down a little bit, scroll down to the second system, still this page. Virgine, right. The same thing here, um, virgine. It's not virgine, so you have to put a decrescendo. So mark up, feel free to mark these scores up. Um, Let's look at, uh, let's continue. The sopranos go, So they should breathe there, but the lower parts should not let go of their half note just because the soprano is breathing. That's crazy. But you might have the uh, lower parts decrescendo throughout tomb so they can really hear the soprano part. I'm going to just rattle off you know, a lot of concepts here. Um, Include pro omine, make sure... Um, that they don't sing pro homine, there's no H in Latin. You don't pronounce H, so it's pro homine. And again, homine, you really have to, I would put a decrescendo throughout the whole measure. And I just, what is that, 17 homine. Oh, just come away. And then you might even have them, I mean, I usually say come away to the last note, but not through the last note, but I can see, you know, there's, there's an exception to all rules. All right, because the orchestra is coming in, you might want to fade fade away throughout the whole note. Let's go on to the next page, please. Who used latus effolatum? Breath. Unda fluxit sanguine. Right. It's the same the same principles, but here you have um, Mozart doesn't mark it, but I have a very strong feeling that I should 
take a little bit of time before Estonobis. It's a new section, it's a new text. So the, I'll, I'll sing the soprano part from measure 17. Just a, a retard. I, I wouldn't even call it a rubato because it's like a good three beats of a, a retard. And then um, it just seems to make sense. And then Estonobis, now you have this uh, du du two duets. So how do you conduct this? Well, I'll scroll down a bit so, so I can see the second system. You know, you're bringing the ladies in on esto, and then the men come in on esto, you know, one measure later. So you have to choose who to focus in on as a conductor. So I would bring the ladies in, and then I would bring the men in, uh, abandoning the sopranos and the altos for a brief moment. Because you see that the sopranos go esto no bis, so they come away to bis. So if you're a really good conductor, or somebody who works really hard, who's not a really good conductor, but works really hard on this spot, you can do, you can bring the ladies in and then bring the men in and then immediately turn to the ladies and do a decrescendo. And then in the next measure, you, have, you do a decrescendo for the tenors and basses while facing them, but not for the ladies. You know what I mean? You can go back and forth and that's a nice thing to do. And then you have uh, right before Ian Moore, Right, this is at the end of the line. You have the sopranos who have to breathe, and I really think um, that the lower three parts should breathe also. But do you want to really cut half notes into quarters? That's sort of that's sort of a uh, drastic thing to do. So I'm thinking maybe if you make an eighth breath for everybody, then you're only cutting each note by a quarter, uh, a, you know, 25% instead of 50%. So that seems to be a better idea. And the, I feel there should be a crescendo. Next system, please. Now, the, you know, there's a crescendo here. In mortis examine, but even before ah, it, there seems to be a need to have a, like a grand general climax, you know, and, and the sopranos go up in measure, I think that, what is that, 19 or 29? That's the beginning of the system, beginning of the last system. And the bases go down and it's like a 39. It's a nice accordion effect where the top goes up and the bottom goes down. It's a very wide range, rather wide range uh, there between the soprano and bass. Anyway, my point, my next point is be really, really, really careful that the sopranos go do not go in measure 40 and 41. Oh, geez. You know, if you're giving them a breath before examine, which I do recommend, even though it's in the middle of a thought, then you don't want them accenting teeth because they will. 95% of singers will accent teeth, and the word is more. Uh, the word is more teeth, not more teeth. So you have to make that very clear. Um, and there's a reason. I mean, um, I think most conductors would take a breath there, uh, even though it's in the middle of a thought. It just seems to work. And I think especially with, if you're doing this with junior high school kids, you have to take a breath there. Otherwise, they're gonna sing moho tea sex and they'll start, the hormones will start taking over and they'll start thinking of tea. I know, uh, at least that's a terrible pun, but you're used to it by now. She's shaking her head. Uh, I'm serious, you know, it's like weep on mine eyes and see snot. You don't wanna do that with middle school kids. Okay, and then, um, and then uh, in the, la the last measure, the last two measures of the vocal part, I don't think you want to plow ahead. I, I think you want to go uh, in a slight rubato, you know? And even the very last, the very bit last two measures of the piece. I don't think you have to subdivide the fourth beat because it's just, you know, probably the violin one's doing that. And it's, it's not a multi, multi retard. And that's it. So let's go to the next piece. I don't know if you have any, if you have any questions, you can ask me now, but I think, uh, you know, we should move on because there's so much more to say, but if you have any questions, let me know. Hello, Amaranta, you, you're new to this, so welcome. Um, okay, no questions. Let's do the, the mass in C minor. Well, oh my God, I did this with the members of the Orchestra of St. Luke's. Doesn't get better than that. 
well, maybe the Vienna Philharmonic, I don't know, but they are, they're phenomenal. Um, so, I mean, I grew up, well, as most of you know, I didn't know classical music, pretty much didn't know classical music before college, but, you know, I did the Mozart Requiem uh, in college and, you know, after that a few times. So that, to me, that was, you know how you, you think of pieces, you know, from your youth, where you go someplace, you go back to the home you were born in after 40 or 50 years, you know, you have a great recollection and nostalgia. So when I first heard the, the grand, this great mass in C, maybe when I was, I don't know, 35 or 40, I don't think I heard it before then. Um, I said, okay, this is an incredible work, but is it, a, is it better than the, uh, his Requiem? I mean, that's like sacrilegious. How can anything be better than the Requiem? I think it is. I think it's better than the Requiem. I mean, there's not, there's no dead spot in the Requiem. Oh, excuse me for that pun. There's no, um, you know, spot in the Requiem, which is not uh, well, double negative. Okay, the Requiem is great, every me measure, but this reaches a whole new level. I mean, the Requiem is very short. By the way, I've conducted the Mozart Requiem 19 times in Europe, um, sometimes with orchestra and sometimes just with organ. So uh, that's the Requiem. Now let's go to this great work, which is unfinished, um, as is the, requ the, the Requiem. This too is unfinished. So you can look that up, look up the story. It ends with the Ozana in Excelsis. There's no Agnus Dei. So now um, there's an amazing thing happening here at the opening when the chorus comes in. But even before then, let me just tell you uh, something. When, when I was studying this, I felt a great weight on me, as I did with the B minor mass, the Kyrie. Let's, most of you know the Kyrie, you know, there's a bold opening statement and then um, so we know that, okay? But it took me six months I mean, I was I was going over the opening, um, the opening before that fugal part comes in, the very opening of the Kyrie in my mind for six months. I remember this. I mean, I was doing other things too, but um, just to make sure I got it right, uh, it, there was a bold, beautiful statement, and it's hard to put into words. But I have the same feeling here. Now the the curie of the uh, B minor mass is forte, but and this is this is gentle. It's just marked piano, but see how it's alive; it pulses. Go 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 to the bottom, please. So you you, mark, you have to mark the scores up. You have to mark the scores up. For those of you who are new tonight, it's a total fact. I'm, I'm not. I'm not kidding. Uh, of all the pieces I've ever conducted, how many have I conducted? I don't know. Five thousand, six thousand, over the last half century. I've never gone to the first rehearsal without having sung through every part and put in markings, staccatos, dynamics, decrescendos. Never, ever. You have to. And that, that's one of the secrets. A lot of conductors, young conductors I've worked with, they, they didn't know they should be doing that. Of God almighty, of course you have to do that. You have to lead by example. So this is amazing. If you look at the opening choral entrance, and can you go to the next page? You notice that every single note is in the C minor chord. It's like 30 seconds or no, like a 17 or 18 or 19 seconds of C minor. <laughs> it's astounding. To me, it's astounding. Now, let's, let's delve into this a little more. Okay, it concludes in measure nine. The opening statement concludes in measure nine. Like people might be tempted, conductors might be tempted not to um, have a, so, some subtlety there, tempted to end big. 
Like look at the soprano part in measure six. No, I'm not talking about measure six still. Eleison. No, I don't like that. It's not Kyrie Eleison, it's Kyrie Eleison. Okay, Karina's having fun there, doing something. All right, we're back. Okay, I couldn't do this without you, Karina, thank you. Um, so you see what I mean? Now, you know, I, I really, I'm, I'm sure we all admire Sir John Elliot Gardner, who I had the great pleasure of meeting and having actually dinner with him and, and some people about six months ago or eight months ago. <clears throat> Who's not a great admirer of him? He, he really nails it, he understands everything. But let me just say this, um, even with him, I feel like I might've done some things a little differently. Let's put it that way. Am I a better conductor than him? No, I mean, that's ridiculous to compare. But um, I really basically have never heard any performances of anything that I've studied that I would do the same exact way. And that's great. Everybody has his and her own opinions, right? I would come away there. I would say also, um, there's a danger when working with uh, professional soloists, there's a danger if you're not in control of it and not aware of it, that they would sort of go off on their own at times. Um, how can I describe this? It's not here, it's later on. We'll, be, we'll look at various movements where there are soloists, where they don't, they don't have the tendency to come away to weak syllables at the ends of phrases. And if you want them to, you have to nip it in the bud. In rehearsal, even before you start rehearsing with them, tell, tell them, I, you know, very nicely and collegially, like I like to shape, shape it that way because uh, most of them I, I found in my life, and I've worked with many hundreds of soloists and I don't know, scores of soloists or maybe over a hundred that I've gotten from management, people with pretty big careers, for example, who you're afra almost afraid to tell them, but they, they like when you have, you have ideas, you know? And, uh, okay, so I would come away to that. And then the sopranos, on breath. And they go on, go on, Karina, go to the bottom system. And that's, I have that as, in my mind as forte. And I mark that. That's the, uh, that's the whole chorus. That's not just the soprano soloist. Now, um, I'm of the, uh, of the school of thought and of the mind too. Um, when you have a, um, an imitative passage, uh, whether it's completely fugal or not, like the altos here in measure 13 come in with the same music the sopranos came in, but a fourth lower. And since they're a fourth lower, um, most of the time I like to have the part that has done its thing to recede and let the others be heard. And um, that's a very important tool uh, which should be exercised, I think. So here's the soprano in measure 12. And then you come away to song. Again, it's a very quick breath. So their tendency is going to go with whatever the dynamic marking is on the high G after that. They're going to go. Not, I mean, not everybody, but you know, even the very good amateurs will pounce on son, which is of course child abuse when you pounce on son. Okay, Elise, I'm so sorry. You've heard that 10 times from me. Okay, but I didn't ask you to be here, but I'm glad you are. Um, so you come away <laughs> and then I have the sopranos on met, at a mezzo piano level. Mezzo piano, the altos come in forte. Then scroll, um, then when the tenors come, when the basses come in, when the basses come in, the, I have the, um, the altos right before the basses. I have them, if you look at the measure 16, le, the alto bass, and then the next notes should be, I have a mezzo piano. I have mezzo piano marked even there to match the soprano, but not just that, but I have them coming away to song besides that and then resuming mezzo piano in the next measure. The basses come in piano, uh, forte, as do the tenors. Um, but you see what I'm saying? Uh, there are very often in pieces like this, 
two or maybe even three simultaneous dy dynamic markings and all, you know, simultaneous dynamic markings. Not everybody subscribes to this theory. Um, I've heard it the other way many, many times. I've tried to like it. I basically don't. Think of a, a Bach fugue on the organ with different color on each, you know, different stops, different colors to, so, to highlight the uh, different strands. And here you don't have that. Of course you have different vocal colors, but um, they're not as different, you know, in a sense as our timbres on the organ. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what I think. So- Harold? Then, Sorry, uh, this is Brian, I had a question. Yeah. Um, you said you had the basses come in loudly in measure 18, even though they're not doing the fugal yeah, good. motive. Why is that? Good point. First of all, I, um, hold on, let me go back a minute. It's the opening theme. And to me, that's a very, very good question. But here's my answer. It's the opening theme that the, the uh, violins have. Hold on a second. One second. Yeah. And so it's the only it's the only voice part of the four, which waits for their entrance, and then enters with a different theme than the other three. That's one reason. Uh, in other words, give them their due anyway. But, the, but I think the main reason is um, that they've been waiting so long and they are on bottom. So they're not as heard readily, as readily heard as sopranos. Um, let me just see one more thing, one, more, one second. Uh, the sopranos have a, a four and a half measure solo shtick before the altos come in. And then the, uh, yeah, look at that. The altos have a four and a half measure stick before the bases come in. So it's, you know what I mean? It's like justice has to be served. Let the bases have their, their time. And, and as a conductor, um, whatever they would be singing, I feel like it's time now for the bases to come in or the tenors, but in this case, it's the bases because it's their time. I can't answer it any more than that, but that's how I feel it. It's a very good question. Now let's go to um, measure 25 into 26. You'll notice, um, yeah, yeah. Again, it's, so at that at that point, you have no way of knowing that because I didn't discuss the subsequent measures in this section. But uh, for two measures now, all four parts have been forte. Uh, there's a big crescendo where you see those sixteenth notes. No, it's before that. There's a crescendo. Everybody's forte. Everybody's forte. It's a grand opening. It's a beautiful grand statement, and yet. I want everybody to come away to song in measure 26. I don't want them to go da 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 song. I just don't want that. And I will say that going back to John Elliott, the, the, if there's only one slight difference in interpretation that I often find between me and him um, is that he doesn't come away as much as I'd like him to. But who am I? I mean, he's my goodness compared to. Uh, of his career. Of course, he was supported by Prince Charles and I'm supported by, uh, I don't know, giving piano lessons, I don't know. Anyway, let's go on. Um, <clears throat> so, first of all, we're not gonna have time to go through the whole piece, but I wanna, um, and I don't have a, uh, hold on a second. Yeah, we still have like half an hour or so. So now you have this very soft section and um, there's so much pulsating here. There's so much that's alive, even when, even when it's soft, so that you, that you can discover all this beautiful energy if you sing through each line. So here's the soprano part. Now, why would I, why would I lean heavily on the downbeat just because it's a downbeat? It is the weakest of the three syllables, right? But it's also a suspension. I guess uh, if th those of you, who, I mean, it's a seven, six suspension with the tenors, isn't it? So why not go? Yeah. 
personal, I just feel this ebb and flow all the time. Now, if you do it any other way, I just feel it's not quite as alive. If you sing it, you know, like a bad young chorus, Michael, you know, the mouth flies open from R, I to E. Well, that's crazy, right? And you might think my way is a little too romantic or too too much. I don't think, I personally don't think so. Um, so I wanted to say, I wanted to say that. Now you have the soprano coming in. Let's move to uh, measure 32. Is um, I love, I love when the, yeah, actually let's keep going a little more. Um, I love these tiny little interjections in measure 37 and 38. And there's one more <clears throat> that you see with those whole notes tied over later on. There's something about, there's something so gorgeous about a chorus singing one word interjections. He says senza crescendo, no crescendo. Well, I mean, the word is Christe. Why would you, why, why would you crescendo? Well, people might crescendo, you know, they see faster moving notes, they start crescendoing like Christe. That's a very bad habit when and I see it all the time. Yeah, I have to always tell singers, even my professional singers, that when you see, you know, small notes coming out of a long note, I mean, this is only a dotted quarter, but in, in, re, in relation to it, don't necessarily get louder. They tend to do that. So I might even put a hairpin on cre. But I, I tend to um, almost overemphasize the decrescendos here uh, in, spots like this where there's a little inter interjection to give like finality to give a complete shaping even to a one word it's just a beautiful thing to have a chorus interject and do it so sublimely that it's like angels coming in i you know there's one um in the gloria of the of the misa solemnis by beethoven there's a spot like that but it's the orchestra which comes in twice. Um, for only a measure or so. If you have a chance, listen to it. And I think on my website on nyvirtuoso.org, there's a, a recording of that, that that was made at the Bard Festival with my expanded chorus of 120 professional singers. And it just all these years later, it was like 15 years ago when we did it there, or more, it gives me shivers to hear the chorus, just sing those. those. It's a little bit like also um, Mozart's 41st Symphony, where there's a, a very, yeah, right right before dun, 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 there's a, uh, like a two measure segment where I, the strings come in with a five part fugal thing for like two measures. It's astounding, Ast it's otherworldly. It's also, I, I hear that in Beethoven's late string quartets like the 131 in C sharp minor. He's, it's just otherworldly. And, and it's a good idea to, for a conductor to bring that out. Okay, I went on and on, but now let me be a little technical. Uh, looking at measure 47. Measure 47. Okay, how do you deal with those, those formatas? Look at there are three formatas in 49, 50, and 51. Okay, how do you deal with that? So, very easy. I mean, if you think about it, it becomes easy. Let's look at the first one. Let's look at the last two measures on the top. So dun, 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 dun. You have to cut the strings off. Well, it's more than the strings. I mean, in the, I'm looking at the full score. It's it's everybody. It's the oboes and bassoons and the, the strings. They have half notes. They don't have fermatas during the half note like the soprano soloist does. So you have to cut them off. Dun, dun, three, four, one, two, off. But the soprano is still holding her G, her, her, e, her E flat. So how do you proceed 
do you let her proceed? Can you scroll down just a bit? Keeping the, wait, keeping the, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, you have to bring the orchestra in. In this case, it's the, um, let me just think. I'm sorry. It's, yeah, it's the violins, the violins and violas, right. It's the violins, violas and bass, and, you know, cello and bass, which come in on the downbeat of measure 30 on page 10. Is 30, is that a 50? I can't, oh, it's 50. Page 10, I think that's a 10. Um, so you're holding the, you're cutting everybody off, the soprano's still there, but you can't rely on her. You, you, sh you shouldn't give her, uh, you shouldn't put her in the position to tell you when she's going on, because that's not enough time. You have to give uh, the, the fourth beat. Wait, let me think. Uh, well, uh, you have to give the third beat so she can come in on the fourth beat like this. So you, you cut the strings off and then you have to go three, four, one, so that she comes in on four. If you let her just sing the fourth note, then you won't, you wouldn't be able to sing to give the uh, strings a, a a prep gesture for their entrance in measure fifty. Now, having said that, you know it's slow enough. Here's Plan B. If you forget to do that, then I think she's going ah, well, right when she does it. You can give the fourth beat, but I would recommend giving the third beat. Now here we are again. Um, what do you do here? Um, the uh, the strings will cut off on their own. You don't have to cut off an eighth note. They're not even going to hold it for a full eighth note. They have a way of going um, and you know, listening to each other and cut off. But then you have to do the same thing. You have to go two. In this case, you have to give her the second beat to allow her to sing the G natural on the end of two. Right. Right. It's enough just to give her two. Although she's coming in a half a beat later, it's so slow, it's fine. Let me give it a correct B flat. Off. Now, when you cut off, your right hand has to be on the right side because the next thing you're giving is four. Great. You're giving the prep gesture to the downbeat. So that's an interesting spot. Now, a few measures later, you have another set of uh, promoters. She goes, Christa, Please, there. that's correct, correct pitch. And I cut off the strings on the, on their second beat, and she's still holding the. Um, one second. You don't have to do anything here because there are no players. Let her finish herself. And then, then you give her the fourth beat. I mean, why not? You don't really have to, you can go, you can do nothing and give the second beat to the players who come in on three, but that's a little awkward. It's a little nicer to just set the tempo and give them the downbeat. Either way, you know, either way. Here's an example where if you don't rein the soprano in, if she's not sensitive, um, she might go in measure 56, she might go, Christe, instead of Christe. You know, I, you might want that stay to stand out, but I don't want that. By the way, I heard a recording today of Bach Cantata 51, Yauxet, which I had the pleasure of conducting. Anybody, I don't know if you know that, but it's for solo soprano. And when I did it in 19, I shall be 98, 1998. I hired Robert Lowe. I think his name was Robert Lowe, who sang this soprano cantata, including a high C, and it was A440. He was a, he was a soprano, not a countertenor. It was astounding. Anyway, why am I bringing this up? If you go on YouTube and you type in Bach Cantata 51, I think it's the fourth one down. It's a French group. And the soprano is so astounding. I've never heard anything like it. The coloratura, the phrasing, and the, 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 the absolute ease of the high C's that she sings, astounding. Okay, and here we go again, you know, the chorus. 
It's so nice to shape. It's so nice to shape. That's what makes audiences love it. Okay, let's look at um, the next movement. We have some time. Are there any questions? You know, it goes back to the opening. What a, if you want to have a, a, re, a real spiritual experience, then, you know, listen to this piece <laughs> from beginning to end, but, and really focus. I mean, try to clear your mind and really focus on the genius of Mozart here. Or sometimes it's even, you know, have an even better experience, at least I do when I see the performer, see the performers, like on YouTube, obviously now. Um, I forget which performance I liked most of all, uh, but um, I just forgot. Maybe it was a German group. Oh, okay, now, let me say this about the opening. I'm thinking of the Vivaldi Gloria uh, in a sense. Dun, 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 right? And they go, Gloria, Gloria, uh, an amateur group would go, Gloria, 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 because the mouth flies open, you know, it's like the same with hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So I like to, when I do Vivaldi's Gloria, I've done it a few times, I like to, Gloria, Gloria, have them come away. It's nice, it's the way you speak it. But here, well, in this particular spot, I would have a staccato on A, ah, Gloria, and I would have them come away. But later on in the movement, and I might not find the spot, but I probably will, um, I don't necessarily have them coming away to the A. Ah. Actually, it might not be this movement. I don't know. There's, there's, there are a couple of places. I'm not going to say there's a couple of places. I hear everybody on TV saying there's a couple of weather patterns coming. There is a couple. That drives me nuts. Anyway, there are a couple of places where, especially at the ends of movements, for example, ah, you don't have to go to it now, Karina, but the very, 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 very last note of this piece is, um, it's, it's the word in excelsis. Hosanna in excelsis, in excelsis, in excelsis. You know, if you pounce on it, then you're pouncing on cease, which is the sister of the of the boy. So it's it's like uh, never mind. So it's like it it makes to me it's okay to have a, a grand ending. You know, it's really okay. But here I would go, Lord. you know, I might not even come away, come to think of it. But I think a staccato is good. Claudia. And um, I've also been listening, you know, during this pandemic, I've had the opportunity of listening to a lot of music I've always wanted to listen to and hear pieces I haven't heard in a while. Um, there are a lot of performances of Baroque and classical period music where um, the conductors have them uh, do something. And also soloists would go like this. <laughs> like they'd emphasize the 16th. They'd separate them nicely, but they would emphasize them, perhaps coming away, having a little space before them. <laughs> and it doesn't bother me so much anymore. I used, I mean, in certain cases, I used to think like 100% of the time it should be. Like dun ta ta not dun ta ta dun ta ta Like the 16th should be a little bit softer because they're on the ends of the beats. Uh, but when you're training a choir, it's a very good idea not to have them do da 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 because that that will like spill over into other things. It'll just sound very mannered. Coming away too much will sound mannered also. So what you might want to do is put a hairpin on Chell, C E L. Or a little crescendo at the very end. I don't know. It depends. Every circumstance is different, but it's that's what I wanted to say there. Um, okay. And again, you know, it's Marto Legro Vivace, but you have to always determine whether you want something done legato, marcato, poco marcato, combination thereof, you know, one after another. 
Um, <clears throat> For example, the you know obviously when the basses come in, it's not to me it's not be legato. I mean, look at the opening measure, all the uh, all the instruments, all of them, except the organ and the bassi, have that vibrant rhythm. Dun 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 dun, and that's not legato. So you don't want the basses to go no to capture the mood that was set already, but you don't need to keep that throughout. For example, the sopranos. Let's go to the next page a minute. They go, Enoch child. Do you really want, do you really want Enoch child? <laughs> I'm, losing, I'm looking at a, the wrong clef here. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's G. Enoch child. Enoch child. Next every note. Actually, I might now no, that I'm thinking of it. But my point is um, that within, I'll show you other examples where uh, it might start out um, staccato or marcato and change rapidly. Um, so let me just. I'm thinking of, let's say, hallelujah chorus, you know? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Obviously that's not legato, but for the Lord, that's legato, that kind of thing. Or uh, Handel's Dixie Dominus. Et in secula seculorum amen. But then further along, it becomes suddenly legato. That's what I'm saying. Don't get stuck thinking something that starts one way has to remain that way. Um, and even at the very end of this movement, uh, once again, um, yeah, let's go to the very end. Of, well, let's skip to the next one. I was just gonna say, it can come away nicely to that. Um, let's just skip the next one. We only have a few minutes. So let's just, I mean, this next movement is a killer. It's on any soprano, it's gorgeous. He wrote it for his wife, Costanza. Um, yeah, the question is, can you give, at this tempo, do you give one, one prep or two for a high school orchestra, you might want to go two, three. But for a professional orchestra, I think it's enough just to go. Now, notice what I'm doing here. Some of you who have studied with me, uh, I've told you this, this technique. Um, hold on a second. This technique whereby instead of giving just one prep gesture like this dun, dun, you can go like this dun. in other words extended at, at the very start it, it's, it moves into the tempo slowly instead of this which would be one beat dun, you do this see the difference between and that big difference. It gives them time to think, to prepare, and yet it sets the tempo magically. It's unbelievable. It's a little trick. Um, anyway, let's go to the, third, the fourth movement. Oh, let's go to the very end of this movement, the very end of it. Yeah, look, there's a lot of life to this. It's very exciting. So look at the, the final few measures. Uh, keep going. You had it. And it just, there it is, there it is. So look at the bottom of the page. It's no, I wouldn't do it like that. I would not go. I would go. See the tiny retard rubato that I took. That's just my feeling. I can't explain why I would do that, but I don't think composers would, I don't think Mozart would have minded. And maybe that's the way they did it from the start. Okay, the gracias, the next movement. Um, it's very slow. So there's no reason why you can't do this in, you know, um, subdivided four. There's a lot happening in the strings. 30 second notes, dotted, dotted 16th rest, that kind of thing. 
So is it enough just to give the end of four? Sure. Because even a half beat is, you know, maybe even 60. Uh, eighth note equals 60. Just be careful that you don't conduct it in eight. If you conduct it as if it's in eight, eight time or eight, four time, then each beat would be the same size. One, two, three, four, five. So this subdivider would be one, small, larger, small, larger, small. That helps the instrumentalists a lot because they don't stare at you every moment. So, you know, having a really good picture of where you want each beat to go was great and sticking to it. Well, it's much lower. So, but I'm, I'm just saying one, and two and three and so there are six different spots on you on the horizontal line across your belly button equidistant from each other which is where the beat should go and that's that takes practice um then there's a trio no then there's a duet later on there's a trio usually the tenor from the chorus steps out unless you don't unless you don't have a tenor who's if it's a professional chorus and how many, I mean, very few people have professional choruses, but you could have a tenor step out. And for the quartet later on, you can have a bass from the chorus step out. But otherwise, yes, you're gonna have to hire a bass just for one movement later on. Give him less money, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't, he won't mind. Just like on, on West Wing, when uh, Rob Lowe, who portrayed Sam, quit after the season four because he was only getting 75,000 per episode and Martin Sheen was getting 300,000 and he wanted more than 75 and they wouldn't give it to him and he quit. Okay, anyway, let's go back to this. So he doesn't deserve, does he deserve as much as the president of the United, oh, let's not go there. Okay, now, um, I wanna talk about for a moment before we stop and take questions because we have to stop very soon. Uh, the Qui Tolis, well, you don't have to scroll down unless you, you're able to. It's two movements ahead, it's movement six, movement six, Karina. Anyway, while she's doing, ah, oh boy, you're good. You notice it's double chorus. Just scroll down a little more. Soprano one, alto one, alto tenor two. It's, yeah, it's double chorus. And it really is nicely antiphonal. So yes, you, what you wanna do during the previous uh, duet or right before the duet preceding this, you want the chorus to move very quietly, move, have it work that ahead of time. So they're antiphonal and um, I think they stay that way till the very end. I'm not sure I forget, um, maybe not, but that's important. And then you have to swivel. Yeah, you have to swivel. You have to conduct one chorus and then another. Sure, like the same happy passion. Okay, um, I can go on, but I think it's just about time. Are there any questions about these pieces, this piece or anything else related to choral music or West Wing? Yes. Huh? Okay, Karina, can you? Oh. Great. Okay. So, Harold, am I Go ahead. Saying, like, um, I think it was the Gloria, and you were saying like, don't make the the H's so harsh and the ha 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 like too much H's. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you're no, saying like, don't have too, too much. much. Yeah. Not not so much. It's just too much weight. Ah. Oh. Okay, so you would you leave little H's in there or no? Are you talking about? Oh, I see what you mean. Like here, when when they're going glow, ho 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 ho. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, ho, ho. it's impossible to eliminate them. I think you're right. The audience won't hear them. They won't hear H's. Glow, ho 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 ho. You know, it's sort of like dun da da dun da da dun. I mean, how else can you do it except you can go glow da da da. No, that's. I mean, if there are melismas. If there are like three measures of 16th notes and you have an amateur chorus, one of Robert Shaw's tricks was to have half the singers sing and the other half to go the actual small D, but not so heavy D. And the audience will not hear the Ds, they'll hear articulation. That's a trick. In this case, you're right. You are doing H's. But uh, blah, 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 blah. but they won't they won't be perceived as H's. They'll be it will be perceived as very articulate, what um, articulated, and separated nicely. Okay. Yeah. 
Any other questions? So, um, so next week I'm doing the St. Matthew Passion, the choruses. Obviously, you know, it's the piece is three hours and 20 minutes long. We won't get to everything as usual, but I will cover a lot. And then in January, uh, I mean, we'll, we can, I forget what's the week after that, but then I think it's in January uh, that we have two sessions where I'm bringing aboard professional singers, uh, three or four of them alongside me to talk to composers and soloists. You know, one week it's composers because they have ideas as I do how to help composers writing choral music and singers as far as careers go and just actually um, hearing some of them and coaching them. It'll be nice to watch. All right. Thank you, Carol. Oh, Celeste. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, Celeste. Hi. Uh, it's nice. sort of okay. Oh, no, I said that last week. Nice bookcases. Oh, no, I said that last week. Never mind. <laughs> well, they're, they're filling up. You keep making me get more and more editions. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, <laughs> build more because <Okay. laughs> I like to look at the, the full score uh, for this stuff. But um, uh, just a blast for the Brahm Requiem off the top of my head, but it might apply to other choral music. Um, I love the Brahms. Who doesn't? It's a desert island piece and love hearing it in, in German, but I know uh, there are choruses that sing it in, in English. What do you take on that? I have, my, I have my own personal ideas on that, but I'm curious what your take on that is. Well, let's go to Bach a minute. If I would hear if I were to hear Bach in English, I think I would recoil more than I would hearing Brahms in English. Um, now let's go to Mendelssohn, because Mendelssohn wrote some things in English, right? So that doesn't bother me because I know he wrote it in English. Let's go to Handel, whose was his first language was German, obviously, and he had bad English, which is why he writes "For unto us a child is born" and things like that. Um, I don't think it would bother me that much, you know, um, think of the whole concept of uh, the Reformation. I mean, one of the tenets of the Reformation was performing in the vernacular, right? So I don't think it would bother me. And maybe, maybe it's because I've heard the Brahms done in English. Uh, of course, all in all, you know, if you have to sum it up, I mean, it seems to me like, um, except for Bach, you know, uh, generally speaking, I think the audience would appreciate grasping the meaning immediately if it's in their own language. You know, but then now, then, then there are certain, you know, problems, or di let's say differences, which might create some problems when you do things in different languages. Um, or it, it just takes away the charm. I mean, I, can you think of I can't think of doing the trois chansons of Debussy in German or English. That's because the language is so beautiful. But German, you know, has so many consonants and, and rules about starting every word with a glottal. So, yeah. That's well, I guess, I'm not, I guess what I'm thinking of is also that when the composer is writing in his language, Mendelssohn could speak several languages. He was fluent. He wrote in English. You know, I could see a different case being made for him uh, in different ways. But um, I guess it bothers me when I hear uh, where there are more syllables and such oh. for a word. And, and I can't see it extricated from the, the musical, the whole musical you know, the organic whole of, of, the, of the phrase or whatever, you know, it sounds like sometimes it may dribble off with an extra half a beat or whatever it is, you know? Yeah, it seems incumbent upon the translator to make the same number of syllables, it seems to me. Um, and you know what I mean? Like, blessed are they who mourn. You don't want to say, oh, thrice happy are they who mourn. I mean, you don't want to, yeah, you don't want to ruin it like that. But I, I, I don't know. I don't know that I've come across one that makes it simply, you know, 
syllabic that way. And then here's another thing, another issue, is that yeah. uh, I am not fluent in anything except uh, you know, New Yorkese. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, my, my ear uh, in what I've done in composing in my own way, I also hear the actual sound with a certain note expressing something. And if it changes that, that vowel sound or whatever it is, I feel that when a composer is writing, say like Brahms in his own language, his own vernacular language, mm -hmm. um, he's also associating the intent is of course being pursued musically, right? So you'll hear a different vowel sound or the sound has to change different. It, the word itself, if even if you didn't know what the word meant. Okay, uh, actually, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. And I'm, I'm not sure if I would subscribe to that, but there, I'm sorry, but there is, if you think of it, if, if a composer writes a sustained high A flat for the soprano on A, ah, and the translator makes it an E, E, E syllable, uh, vowel, they're, then they're a problem. So that, you know, that's an interesting idea that you just posed. Yeah. You got, you, so you can't just translate, you have to be aware of the technical difficulties, the trans, uh, yeah, interesting. Anybody else? All right. Thank That's you. All good. Very much. Thank you. Great rest of your week and look out for the video archive of this video as well as the sign up sheet for next week. Have we'll a it again at St. Matthew Passion next week. Yeah, I believe so. It's the whole schedule at nyvirtuoso.org. I think it's the St. Matthew. Yeah. Oh, okay. I should okay, I should check that out. Thank you. nyvirtuoso.org. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Very all right. interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, all. Goodbye.